Welcome to updating the old school with C++11. That's it. No. Oh. Hey. Uh, <laughs> I thought I'd turn that off. All right. So do I have? No, I don't. OK. Now, I was going to try to get a, a remote to work the slides, but unfortunately, I didn't have time. I didn't have time for a lot of things. I just had a, a big push at work that ended Tuesday night. And then I was sick on Wednesday. So I actually wrote about 3 quarters of this last night. And strangely, they're some of the best slides I've done. So my name is Richard Bateman. I work for GradeCam. GradeCam is a company that uh, produces technology used by teachers. Our kind of our core uh, philosophy is that technology should assist people to do what, things the way that they are doing them and that they want to do things, but give them the additional tools that technology can give them without trying to force them to change in all ways faster than they're ready to. Um, and so our core technology with GradeCam is basically a technology that allows you to print out a bubble answer sheet and read it with a webcam. That sounds very simple, but it's actually extremely powerful because you can do things like uh, giving a quiz to your class and then scan it either with your cell phone or have them file past your computer, just set it up underneath the document camera, uh, record all that information in, the, in our web app, give them instant feedback on how everybody did and say, oh, hey, number seven, 40% of the class missed. They thought it was D and it should have been B. Maybe I better reteach that. They can reteach it immediately rather than having to wait until later uh, when the students have already forgotten what they were talking about. It's very context uh, specific, formative assessment, insert other fancy buzzwords here. But it's really cool stuff because when I go and talk to teachers who are actually using it, the teachers are so excited because it actually helps them and it helps them be better teachers. And I really enjoy that. I'm somebody who likes to feel like I'm making a, a positive difference in the world, which is another reason I didn't stay at with Move because Move is a wonderful company. It's now Dish Digital. Uh, but at the end of the day, I just have a hard time feeling like helping people watch better quality television is necessarily improving the world. In fact, sometimes I wondered if it was the other way around. But our presentation to goal today is to discuss new C++ features, C++11 features. Uh, color didn't work very well here. Probably can't read that, but this presentation is not exhaustive. I'm not making any claim that I'm covering all of the features. But see, these are some of the ones that to me were the most meaningful. A um, little bit more about myself. Uh, I am a ham radio operator, as you may notice if you see my, my shirt. Uh, hamstudy.org, which is the website recommended for the people doing the ham radio stuff here, is uh, one of my side projects, one of my main ones. It's become a, a very popular site. So I also do a lot of web stuff, uh, both back end and front end when I have to. I'm very slow at front end, but I can still do it. Um, definitely not a designer, but uh, my online nick, if you see me online, it is Taxilian, T-A-X-I-L-I-A-N. And so if you look for me on Stack Overflow or something like that, that's where you'll find me. Um, my Twitter handle is Taxilian backwards, Nalix at. Anyway, um, and uh, I've already told you a little bit about Firebreath is, is the project. People who know about it, uh, that's what they would say that I'm best well known for, that or, or ham study if it can either, even be said that somebody is well known for something that's as niche as either of those two things are. But we're going to get started right away. Now one thing about this presentation is it's going to be almost like lots of little mini presentations on specific features. Uh, so if you have a question about anything, let me know. Who's familiar with Null Pointer? In fact, who's familiar with C++11 features at all? A couple of you? Okay. Well, good. So you're in, you're in the right place. How many of you have actually used C++ in any real capacity? OK, so there are a couple of you that are just interested in learning more about C++, and some of you want to know it's new. Excellent. That's perfect uh, for what I'm looking for. So the old way that you've always in C or C++ done things is you have a type, pointer, variable name equals null, right? Because you want to initialize it as a null pointer so it's not uninitialized memory that might be pointing to, no, to something, et cetera. That way, you're never going to try to execute code that doesn't exist. Here's the new way. In C11, we've added null pointer. Very similar. Isn't that awesome? Is everybody excited about that? So, what's the difference? 
Null pointer is not an ent. Does anybody know where null, all caps, comes from? It types like definition. It's not a type it's a define. Basically, somewhere, I don't even remember which header file it's in. But yeah, it probably varies by system. Well, no, it's no equals because it's a define. Zero. That's what null is. Now, what is the type of zero? It's an int. So it is not an int. Now, why does that matter? So let's take these two code samples. Can you guys read those? I tried to make them as big as I could, um, but there's only so much you can do when you're fitting code on slides. And so some of them may be a little hard to read from the back row. You might have to move forward, because this is really not the best screen that they've got here. Um, but uh, so here we have a polymorphic, or an yeah, overloaded or polymorphic function. One takes an int a, and the other one takes a const car pointer. Right? Well, when you want to create, what, what is a C style string? Who can tell me that? It's a char pointer. It's a pointer to an array of bytes. And what delineates the end of the string? No. So if you have a const car pointer and you assign it to null, that's an empty string, right? Totally valid string. So what is the output of this going to be? It will be true. What is the output of this going to be? This one is going to be false because it's going to call, call the top one. And it's going to be, it's less than negative 20. Come on in. We're talking about C++11 features. Or go away. Either way. Or even stand in the door. I don't really care. Well, I kind of, you know, anyway. All right. So that's going to be false. Now, how about this? Car pointer E equals null, old style. Is correct E. What's this going to return? It's going to return false. Because it's going to call this one, right? We have a null string. It's going to call that one. All right. What's this going to call? And what's going to be the result? We're, we're passing a null pointer, right? No, we're not. We're passing in an int. It's going to call the first one, and it's going to be true. Not really what we want. How about this one? False. False. So no pointer, and, and this is a very simple contrived example, but there are times when the fact that the, the define null is an int is a problem. And so no, no pointer will implicitly convert to any, any pointer type as null, but it is not an int. So that becomes important sometimes. Any questions about null pointer? Good, moving on. Wait, what? So can you can't do any ints or arithmetic with their comparisons um, you cannot do necessarily int comparisons, but you can do Boolean comparisons because it will implicitly cast to Boolean true or false for whether or not it's, it's null. So pretty much in all normal cases that you would use it, it will still work the same. Uh, but there are fewer edge cases that it will not do what you expect it to do. It's more explicit. All right, using a better type def. Does anybody have any idea what I'm talking about? You know what a type def is? All right, let, let me modify this a little bit. Using. Using is a better type def. So the, you've seen the, the term using namespace something or other. Or using, uh, what is it? Uh, you know, some, you know, using like standard string as something or other, or using standard string, which pulls it into your namespace. So they've extended in C++11 what using can do. And it can be an alias for type def. So this type def standard, I don't know if you guys can see it. So type def standard map, standard string, comma, int. So this creates a map of strings to ints. We call it int map. Standard, we've been able to do that forever. You've probably done that before. In fact, if you're still sane and you've done C++, you've done that before. Here's the same thing, just using using. 
using int map equals standard map standard string comma int. Those two will produce pretty much exactly the same thing. Isn't that exciting? Oops. That's cute, but why? It's the same thing so far, right? Well, using is more versatile. So say you were trying to create a string indexed map type. Has anybody had to wanted to create a type that is templated? So if you want to create a type that is templated in C++ 98 or C++ 03, you're going to have to create a structure with a type def inside of it that's templated. And then you'll use it by doing string map subtype ent colon colon type, which will be an alias for standard map of string to t to int. And that's, that's valid. It's also annoying. Well, with using, you can actually do a templated using, which is cool. Because you can say template type name t using string type is standard map string comma t. And then you just use string map subtype ent. Not a big deal but it can make your code a lot nicer because you can create more specific subtypes of templated, you know, templated subtypes of templated classes. I also find that over time, I prefer the syntax of using over type def. Yes? I think it does because you have using, and then this is the type name right here. It's more or less, it's formatted the same way that you would expect a normal, uh, a normal variable to be defined. You, know, you have type name, variable name equals whatever. Well, type name is now using, but it's still this, it's a familiar syntax. I do find it easier to read that way. Um, I don't know if you guys have heard the question. The question is, does it help with sometimes like the type desks and stuff are a little bit hard to read. All right, moving on. Are, are value references and move semantics? I almost hesitate to go into this this early in the presentation. Hopefully uh, it doesn't take too much time, but this is one of the biggest changes in a C++ 11, because this isn't just a little minor like change in how you do things. This is actually a total game changer. So who knows what an R value versus an L value is? Two? A couple of people who have an idea. All right. An R value is the value on, a right side, on the right side of an expression, which is generally speaking a temporary value. Has anybody here written a compiler besides me? A couple of us? OK. Uh, if any of you take like a, the computer science course here at UVU, you'll have to write a compiler. It will be basically your senior project. And you will have to learn what, how this stuff works. As the compiler is putting things together on the right side of an expression, Basically, it's creating temporary values and then using that for the next section, then creating a value for that and using that for the next step, step. These are all temporary things. And you can actually end up with a case. For example, look at this. We have standard string, LVAL string. Now, the compiler is actually going to optimize this so that it's not quite this way. But if it were to do it literally the way that it's written, it would actually say, OK, I have a standard string, LVAL string. So I'm going to define a variable in the stack. Um, called that, a local variable. And I want to assign it to this, but this can't, but in order to assign uh, a C string to a standard string, first I need to convert this into a standard string, and then I can assign it. So it will create a standard string around this, which will then pass this R value into the standard string, and then that R value will get assigned to LVAL string. So compiler will actually optimize this away. But if it didn't, we've just copied that string three times. And there are cases where it actually will copy it that many times because it's not something that the compiler can easily optimize. It's not something that's basic. So with that, how many L values can we see in here? Okay. OK, the blue arrows, these are L values. This is an L value, OK? It is not a temporary variable. It's something that's created on the stack, or yeah, in the current scope, on the stack. Uh, this is still an L value. It's that L value. And this is an L value, OK? So by that definition, you know, by that, you can see everything else is an R value. As I kind of discussed, 
This is an R value, this is an R value, or at least it will be created into an R L value. This is kind of a, a, stat, a constant value too, so that gets a little more complicated, but we'll pretend it's just normal L value for our purpose. This here, where we say standard string this, that's actually going to create a standard string, which will be around for as long as this line needs to run, and then it will go away. That's an R value. Now that's kind of inefficient, because we've just created something, we've copied its memory over to something else, and then we destroy it. So what they've done is they've added R value references. So let's look at this. We are using standard C out and end L and standard string. So we have print string, take string with one ampersand, that's a standard reference that you've all seen, by string. Then we have another polymorphic overload, print string, string double ampersand. So a double ampersand is a new reference type, um, which is called an R value reference. So any R value is going to call this one, and any L value is going to call this one. And it's going to print out L ref and R ref. And then we're going to call this with four different values. With this first one, which one is it going to call? R value or L value? R value. What about this one? R value. Now we define a string LV str and we pass that into print string. R value or L value? L value. Exactly. And I did actually execute this one to make sure that I was doing it correctly. I think this is the only code on here that I had time to actually execute. So it's exactly right. With move constructors and move assignments, which are new things, you've, you've probably seen copy constructors, copy assignments. We now have move constructors and move assignments. They take an R value reference. Basically, what you can do is you use an R value reference, and, and that will, t it, whenever something passes in an R value, you know this is something that's going to go away. So if that's something that's using a lot of memory, then instead of copying it, we can actually steal its memory. So basically we say, okay, instead of, instead of copying it, let's do a standard swap with some garbage value and that, and I'll swap it over. Or if it's a pointer, we say, okay, let's just assign that to this other one. And the previous value that you just assigned to it becomes essentially undefined in an undefined state. Because since it's an R value, we know it's going to go away. Um, they then added standard move, which will cast an L value into an R value. Because there are times when you have, if an R value is passed in, you may need to pass it into something else, or you may know that since this was an R value, everything else is also an R value. And so now we want to do standard move, and that basically casts it to an R value and tells it we can, this is an R value now, and so we can just, you don't worry about keeping track of it. If there's an optimization you can do, go ahead and make that so we can be more efficient on memory use. So if you do this, after this one, A is probably actually going to be an invalid state because it cast A as an R value um, when it assigned it to B, and standard string has a R value uh, move constructor, which will move the contents of the previous one to that one. Most likely, I would guess that A is going to end up being an empty string after that, uh, but I haven't actually executed it to test. But that's the... It's a much more complicated subject than I'm going to have time to go through right now. Um, but those are move semantics. Um, and a move constructor, a move assignment, moves the memory from the old object to the new object, which invalidates the old. It's worth reading. Any questions there? Am I going too fast for everyone? OK, I'll move faster. Um, type inference with auto. C11 has added this auto keyword. Before, he used to say int a equals 5, double b equals 3.5, float c equals 3.5f, uh, const car pointer d equals something. Now you can say auto. Isn't that exciting? Why? Why does it matter? I mean, is it really harder to just write int a, double b, float c, const car pointer d? So let's look at, at why. Who has written a function like this? 
Who wanted to gouge their eyes out after writing a function like this? That's after reading somebody else's function like this, usually. Um, so we have here a function that takes a constant standard map. That, I meant that to be a reference, but oh well. A, con a standard map of a string to a pair of int and type t in a templated function. And then it loops through that using a const iterator, begin to end, and calls a function after pulling out the pair so we can pull out the value of the t type in the, in the thing. Yes, <laughs> but I have actually, like, this is kind of a contrived example, but I have actually had to write code like this before. Um, now, usually, you're going to use some type defs to, to, to make things a little bit smaller. However, let's just rewrite that and use auto now. So here, where we had four standard maps, standard string, standard pair, blah, 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 colon, colon, const iterator, we just replace that whole thing with auto. <laughs> because auto <laughs> because auto is going to see that and be like, oh, that's the return type of this. It's coming back. I need a variable that can take that return type. All right, let's do it. Oh, just wait. Just wait. <laughs> All right. Now. What if I told you that we can iterate over STL containers without iterators? That we never have to type iterators at all? <laughs> Am I the only one? <laughs> all right. Range loops. Range loops are new in C11, and they are awesome. Instead of that iterator, anything that has, that follows the, uh, the STL iterator pattern proper, properly, and I don't know the exact requirements for this. I do know that there are some libraries such as Boost that will t basically have um, templated things that will convert almost any type of array like thing to this. Um, but you'll have to do some more research to, to use it with things that aren't STL containers. But this is that same thing. We're just saying for auto cur. So auto is, in this case, going to basically be a, um, a pair of standard string to this um, in nmap. And that's going to call this loop once for everything inside that map. And we can then just say auto cur pair is nmap.second. Notice, if this were an iterator, that would be a hyphen greater than to indicate that it's a dereferencing kind of a pointer. That's not needed within a, a range loop. Way cleaner. And now, let's use using, clean it up a lot, say, OK, we're have, we have an int pair map of type t with that whole long thing. And now look what we've got. Is that a little more readable than the previous one that we started with? Now, here's an example of range loops and vectors. So that was, a, that was a map is kind of a complicated example. But this, if you have an int vector, auto current colon int vector, and it will just call it with current will be the value of the vector for each element, and it will get called. Now, just as an FYI, if you need to access, if, if you want to access the thing that's actually in the vector and possibly be able to change it, you can add auto ampersand to say loop through the references to that, and that will work as well. Pretty cool? Yeah. All right. Type inference with decal type. So we've just learned we can do auto A equals 5. We can then say decal type A, B equals 3.5. And what's it going to do? We'll do a compiler warning. But decal type A will, re will resolve at compile time to the value of a, whatever, to the type of a. Whatever type a is, it will, uh, it will resolve to. So you could say auto a equals 5, or you can do decal type a, and then even if the thing you pass in is not an, an int, it will have to be converted to that. 
Now, we will get a, a compiler warning because anytime you try to assign a double to an int, it'll say, hey, I'm losing data here. Compiler warning. Again, cute, but why? Here's some things to consider. So if we have a vector string, a vector of strings, who has done a for loop just iterating through the indexes of a vector? You know, just using sub i. Okay. What type do you normally use for i as your indexer? If you're using int, you're technically doing it wrong, and you could actually have problems because the type should be size t. Now, if this wasn't a vector, and this, I've actually had this happen before, where I didn't know what type it was, and I couldn't get to it. So we can say auto a equals 0. That's going, a is going to be an int. If we say auto b equals a dot size, well, b is now a size t, because that's what type that returned. And so it's going to, have to make that the correct type. Well, but what if we want c to be 0? We want to start our int. We can use decal type. And that will give us the type returned by a.size. See, that's a really cool thing about decal type is it can take a function. And, it will say, and that will say, I want this to be the type returned by this function, even though I'm not assigning it to this function. And now we can do a for loop, decal type a.size, and we're actually using the right type here. We're not going to be using the wrong type and potentially getting compiler warnings and, oh, you're assigning an unsigned to assigned and blah, 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 blah. It's just going to work. So is this a preprocessor? It, it is. It's a compile time thing. Um, there are also some differences from auto in some cases. So if you have a const int a equals 42, if you say auto b equals a, well, a, a was defined as being const. But in this case, there's no reason that it knows that b needs to be a const. It's just going. To, it's not going to assign a b to the exact same type as this. If it did, this is also technically const, because you can't change a compiled, you know, constant, a compiled constant. So it's going to drop the const because all it knows is I need a variable b that can hold this value. But if you use decal type a, it's exactly the same thing. So there are occasionally some times when auto and decal type will do a slightly different thing there. Um, and there's a lot more. Um, there's a lot more, uh, yeah, little things, but awesomeness and, and, and specifics and, and the word I'm looking for is totally eluding me, but that's okay. All right, get your foo on with lambda expressions, standard bind, and standard function. Who knows what a lambda function is? Lambda expression. Somebody want to give me a, a definition? So pretty close. So lambda expression, the output of lambda expression is a special unnamed temporary closure type object. Everyone got that? <laughs> OK, here are some rules for lambda expressions. First, don't worry about type, just accept and use auto or standard function. The actual type of lambda expression is going to be some long, unreadable, randomly generated at compile time, maybe based on some kind of a hash and I don't really know thing. Okay? But we don't care. Second, be very aware of scope. Third, be very aware of lifetime. And fourth, bask in the wonderfulness that is C closures. Okay? Let's look at more detail. So don't worry about type, just accept. So if we get algorithm, which is what we need for standard count if, we can say auto count filter equals, this is our scope, int cur. So this is creating a lambda uh, closure with that pulls in this by value in the scope, uh, accepts one integer, returns a bool, and returns if cur is equal to needle. Okay, And it will assign that lambda to count filter. Standard count if will take an iter a begin iterator, an end iter iterator, and a unary function of, what, of, of the, uh, the type of whatever these iterators are going to return. And what that will do is that will execute count filter on every item inside haystack. And that will return true for everyone where they're the same. And it will give us a count of what those are. 
We could have done the same thing by writing a separate function up above that did that, but we wouldn't have had the needle in it because we needed needle copied in. Um, there are obviously other ways you can do that. Uh, we could use standard bind, as we'll see later on, but this is much easier than the ways that we had before. Number two, be very aware of scope. Here is the basic syntax for creating a closure. So I want to point out a few specific things. The brackets, this is what defines your, your capture list. Then you have your argument list, types and everything, just like a function. Then the little hyphen greater than and the return type. Now hyphen greater than return type in C++14 is entirely optional because it will automatically figure out what it is returned. In C++11, it is optional if you have a very simple function. I think it's just if it's a one line function that just returns something. If it's more complicated than that, then you have to provide the return type. My general rule of thumb is I usually just always specify a return type unless it's a pain and then I leave it off and see if my compiler complains. So let's look at the ca capture list. Open, close, stores the capture list. If you have nothing, an empty bracket pair, it does not capture anything. So it's a closure with no data, okay? If you do equals, when it compiles, it will look and find all of the variables that you've used inside that exist in the parent scope that you created it in, and it will copy them all by value into that closure. You use ampersand, it will automatically capture the same way all of the variables by reference. If you do, for example, this, it will capture the this pointer by value. I don't think you can capture the this pointer by reference, but I haven't actually tried that I remember. I might have tried and it didn't work. I don't remember that for sure, though. Um, but you can also do specific variables uh, or specific variables with some of them by reference, some of them by value, vice versa. Okay. Questions on that? Will you get a compile time error if you call if you use this while not in class? Uh, compile time error if you use this and not in a class. If you haven't captured it, even if you are in a class, then you will get a compile error. And if you aren't in a class, then if you try to capture it, it's going to say it's not. It doesn't exist. And uh, which you know, just like any other time that you would expect. Um, Let's see. I recommend strongly that you avoid this one in particular, but always specify if you need, if you, um, my preference is to always just specify exactly what you need because then there's never any surprises. You'll have compile errors if you're using something that you don't realize you're using, but sometimes it can be a real problem if you capture something that you didn't mean to capture. That has bitten me a few times. Speaking of that, Lambda Expressions rule number three, be very aware of lifetime. So we have a standard function, um, and we'll talk a little more about how that works. This is basically a way of, of providing a type that you can assign a Lambda to. The Lambda has to match the, uh, the what is specified in here. So this is a function that returns an int and takes an int. We say get adder int left hand, and we return and we say, okay, I want to pa capture left hand by uh, reference. I'm going to take a, a right hand, and we're going to return left hand plus right hand. Then here we say auto function equals get add five. See out, I added the value function three. Right? So that should call function. Uh, so, so that here creates a, a um, passes it in here, creates a lambda with five in left hand, right? So when I call function three, it should return five plus three, right? Nope. No. no. Why not? Because the parameter left hand side. Because left hand was passed by address, and once we left that function, it no longer exists. It was on the stack. We now have a dangling pointer, because a reference is still a pointer, even though it's called a reference. It's what we call a fail. Okay? Don't do that. If you have a closure that is not going to be executed before the function returns, and you use by reference to reference something locally, you're going to have problems. 
Don't do it. Any questions on that? Okay, standard bind. This is pulled from Boost. We had Boost bind. Um, bind basically returns a callable object of an unspecified type which wraps an existing callable type. That sounds kind of complicated. Basically, you can use it to bind uh, so you have the, uh, a reference to a function pointer. So standard ve vector int colon colon pushback is a function, comma, address to, you know, pointer to the variable you want it to call on, and then underscore one. That's what's called a placeholder, and it comes from the namespace standard placeholders. You can use, I think, underscore one through underscore nine. You might be able to use more than that. I don't, I don't remember. It kind of varies, and I haven't actually looked that specifically up. This will create a function which will call pushback on this int vector when it is called. Now, it does have just a pointer to int vector, so again, be aware of lifetime even with this, because if int vector goes away, you've now got a dangling pointer. But you can go add to vec3, add to vec4, it's just going to add those in. You can go a lot more complicated with this, but it can be really nice because you basically this basically allows you to bind functions. You can even, so if instead of doing underscore one, if we'd change this to five, then it's just going to, every time you call it with no parameters now, it's going to add five to your vector. And if it had multiple parameters, you can pass in the first, like, the first one or the first two parameters. So the previous thing we did with the lambda, we could do with here. And if we had an add function that took two ints, we could say bind to the add function with five. And then every time we called that function with a new int, it's going to add that to five and return it. Does that make sense? So you can use currying, is what it's called, with this. And there's times when that can be extremely useful. Um, bind is not nearly as needed anymore now that we have lambdas. But there are still times when it makes sense. Any questions on bind? How are we doing on time? We're almost out. I don't know if I make it through everything. We'll, we'll try. Now, function is a templated, templated functor class which can wrap any callable target, including function pointers, lambda expressions, or other functors. So you're going to assign a standard function, uh, a function to a function. You saw how we used it with, uh, with, lambda either, with the lambda earlier. Now, a functor is an instance of a C++ class with the operator uh, function call overloaded, so it can be called like a function. The point is, we don't care if it's a function or not. It looks like a function. It acts like a function, so it may as well be a function. So here's a kind of complicated example of using that. We use placeholders. We do an alias of message handler is a standard function, returns a bool, and takes an int and a string. And then we have a standard fun uh, a normal function. We have, oh, sorry, we have a, a function that will take an array of message handlers and a int and a string, and it will return if any of those things return true, when if any of those functions return to, true with calling it. So this is kind of like what, what they did with uh, the count if. And you can see we can do it with a, a normal function. You can do it with a lambda. You can do it with the output of standard bind. They can all assign to the same type of a thing. And then, uh, and then you can call those all. Um, one of my favorite tricks to do with this, if anybody has ever written some kind of a parser or a message handler or something where you have maybe a key, it's like, well, every time I get the command add, I want to call this function. And, and, and you have a, a map of these functions. Most of the time, the naive way of implementing that is to basically have a big, long either if or case statement where you say, if it's this, call this function. If it's this, call this function. If it's this, call this function. What I like to do it is I create a map of standard vectors, or a, a map of, of uh, standard functions with the type that I want. And I have command name to function call. When I get the thing, I parse it. I take the function. And I say, OK, look this up in my map. If I found something, call that function and use the re return value. Instant uh, command dispatch. Very, very useful, used all over the place in Firebreath. Any questions on function foo? All right. Got to get through at least this one. Uniform initializers. See, I haven't actually timed this talk. Uniform initializers. Old style initialization. You can initialize an array of strings with brackets, right? Awesome presentation. Isn't that cool? 
You can create a string this way, great presenter. You can create ints this way or this way, right? Function style or normal style. Now we're going to initialize a vector of strings. And it's not so pretty. If we have to initialize a, an STL container or another class that works similarly, it can get really ugly. So we create a vector of strings, and then we have to do pushback for each one. Now, as a side note here, pushback is almost is practically deprecated at this point. You should use in place back instead most of the time. The reason why is in place back will take um, right will take our uh, value references and we'll actually use a move instead of a copy if, it need, if, if possible. So just note that I didn't have time to figure out a good way to put it in my slides. Or we can create a vector of, of strings that it starts out as too long, and then we can say set 0 to the awesome and 1 to presentation. Or if we include boost, we can use boost assign list of. I don't know if you guys have seen this before. But this actually returns basically an adder that you call it with a function or with, with, with a string or with, you know, with type t, and it will add it to the vector and return another adder. So then you call that with another one, and you can just chain these things for as, as many as you want. So before C++11, that was the cleanest way of doing it. However, yuck. I mean, that is just a pain. With new style uniform initializers, you can initialize a string using Notice the equals is now optional. Just open bracket, awesome, comma, presentation. Or you can create a string, b, instead of parentheses, just open bracket, great presenter, close bracket. And an int, open, bra open brace, close brace. Uniform initializers will work on pretty much any type and will do generally the right thing. And the best part is you can use them with STL containers, and you can write your own classes to use these, uh, the specifics of which are outside the realm of this presentation, unfortunately. So if I have a vector of strings A, awesome, comma, presentation, that will initialize a vector of strings with those values. Map, same thing, except now we have open, and then we pass pairs that are in those. Presenter Richard, class awesome. Much better. Much better. The one caveat with those is that some classes that use a uniform initializer may also have, a, like with uh, a vector, we have a vector of size 2, A2, and that's going to create a vector of size 2. But if you use the braces, it's going to create a vector with one, mem with one value, 2. And that's going to be a little bit different. Any question on uniform initializers? Pretty cool stuff, huh? Spark pointers. Um, unique pointer, shared pointer, weak pointer. Unique pointer, basically, uh, only one thing owns it. If you assign it to another thing, it will remove ownership from the first. It replaces the auto pointer from C++11. It's way cooler. Sorry, I'm like out of time. So rushing. Shared pointer, you can have multiple things that have, have reference to the shared pointer. It will stay around until the last one releases it. Weak pointer is you can assign a shared pointer to a weak pointer, and then you can and it will hold a weak reference. If the shared pointer goes away because all shared pointer instances are destroyed, it will destroy the class, but there will be a piece of memory, a very small piece of memory that will stay around that the weak pointers all have reference to, that will stay around until all the weak pointers are gone, but they will tell the weak pointer that, hey, this class is gone. And so that, you can use that to prevent, to, to solve cyclic, cyclic, uh, cyclic references for shared pointers. There are a lot of other ones, um, but here's a few quick ones. Strongly typed enum. Traditional enum, color, red, green, orange, yellow. Fruit, grape, orange, apple, pear. That won't compile because these are all glo become global to the scope. Uh, so orange and orange conflict with enum classes, you have to access it of color colon colon red, fruit colon colon orange, and so it's much better because it doesn't clutter up your scope. And you can do a strongly typed enum where you do a colon and a type name, and you can use, I believe, any, uh, any primitive type. I'm not sure. You might be able to use any type, and you can actually have an enum that assigns to a specific type. Explicitly deleted functions. 
Uh, you remember how you could delete, you, you know, sometimes you had to provide like a private copy constructor or something to keep people from copying it? Well, the problem is, is if you had something that inadvertently copied it inside the own, your own class, it would still be able to do it. So you can now, so this is the old way, but it had that problem. The new way is you can just say equals default or equals delete. Default says use the default generated one. Delete means don't create this at all and it will not be available. You can do that for both delete and default. Delegating constructors, uh, whereas before, uh, if you had multiple constructors, they all had to completely construct it, you can now delegate to another constructor. So the empty so it calls foo zero, that calls two, makes things much cleaner. Let's see. Um, and that's all. Any questions? All right, hopefully that was helpful. I don't know exactly what versions. I do know the latest version of GCC and Clang support all of these things, plus C++14, plus some of the new stuff. And Visual Studio 2015 supports most of C++11 and some of C++14. So support is much better, but it's actually important to know because support for these features is much better on newer compilers. I think or on the, on the open source compilers than on Microsoft compilers. Most of the things I talked about here are available on all of them because I kind of ended up having to avoid, I had to work on both and so I avoided the features that didn't work in Visual Studio. I think. Um, talk to me after class. There's a couple books I've got that I can recommend, yeah. Question? The presentation is available. If you go back to the, be, uh, yeah, back at the beginning. Oh, I guess I didn't have that here. Uh, Slides.com front slash Taxilian has all of my slides. T-A-X-I-L-I-A-N. All right, thank you guys.